Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Bar Shop seminar um, talk for this afternoon. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Dudley Lamming, um, who is from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Um, Dudley is early in his career. Um, he did his graduate uh, work at um, Harvard in Massachusetts uh, with David Sinclair, and then he moved on to do a postdoc in David Sabatini's lab. He's mainly focused on looking at mTOR and glucose metabolism, specifically in the mTOR complex 2 signaling. Um, he received a K99, and now he has a faculty position at the University of Wisconsin. And today he's going to tell us about decreased consumption of specific macronutrients and how that promotes metabolic health and longevity. And Dudley? Thank you. Uh, first, a word of caution for anyone who's uh, expecting an mTOR heavy talk. This is going to be a very light mTOR talk. We're just going to sneak a little bit in at the end. Um, and this is largely focused on some new directions that my laboratory is uh, taking. So what should I eat? If I'm a laboratory mouse, my choice is really very simple. I eat the food that I've been provided by my experimenters, usually in pellet form. But humans are faced with what noted food author Michael Pollan referred to as the omnivore's dilemma. The fact that we can choose to eat a wide variety of different food choices, choosing between meat and vegetables, soda and water and wine, and uh, cookies or jelly donuts, as the case may be. Um, but when asked what we should be eating, uh, Michael Pollan said that we should eat food not too much and mostly plants. And we're going to ignore the mostly plants today um, that may, might fly in Madison, but perhaps not so much in Texas. So instead, we're going to concentrate on not too much. And of course, from an aging perspective, um, we know that we really shouldn't be eating too much, and that's proven by calorie restriction. So calorie restriction is, of course, a, a very broadly applicable uh, anti-aging intervention. Um, perhaps the gold standard, although certainly rapamycin is giving it a good run for its money. Um, and calorie restriction works uh, in organisms ranging from yeast, which I worked on in my graduate career, um, all the way up the evolutionary ladder to mice, as well as rats, dogs, and even non-human primates. And here's data from the uh, aging study conducted at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison showing that indeed there is a significant extension of longevity in non-human primates. Um, placed on a 20 to 25 percent calorie restricted diet. But the fact that calorie restriction extends lifespan is not the most interesting part about CR. Instead, the most interesting part is its effects on health span. And so in mammals, calorie restriction improves many different types of age related diseases, decreasing the incidence of cardiovascular disease, cancer, decreasing diabetes, and perhaps even, at least in rodent models, and there's some evidence in primates as well, uh, promoting resistance to Alzheimer's disease, disease and other uh, loss of cognition during aging. But of course, this is not what we're really doing in this country. For the most part, um, we've been engaged uh, for many decades in an experiment in the opposite direction, um, where we're testing the effects of overconsumption of calories. And so this is a, a sort of a very familiar map to obesity and diabetes researchers showing that over the last uh, 20 or so years, there's been a massive increase in the amount of Americans who are obese. Currently, there's a little over 28% of Americans who are obese as defined by BMI of over 30. And more interestingly, I think, um, there's an additional 36% of Americans who are technically overweight. So combined, that's about two-thirds of the country uh, that has a serious problem with overnutrition. And of course, there doesn't seem to be an e easy way around this because we're surrounded by cheap and abundant calories and we're indeed programmed to seek out um, those types of uh, foods. Now, obesity is associated with increased risk of many diseases, most notably type 2 diabetes. And of course, in the wake of the obesity epidemic, there's been a significant increase in diabetes as well. Um, and combined, these pose a very major challenge to the country, not only due to the fact that uh, diabetes is bad in and of itself, um, but that diabetes and obesity are both diseases that sort of wear on ones over time. And so while only about 12% of the country is diabetic, a quarter of those over the age 65 are, have type 2 diabetes, and presumably that might even increase in future years as people who are obese continue to become old. <clears throat> 
Um, obesity and diabetes are also both risk factors for cardiovascular disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. So many people are trying to make molecules, be they rapamycin or resveratrol or, or many other interventions, that mimic some of the beneficial effects of a calorie-restricted diet. And so one of the things that we've been doing in my laboratory has been sort of thinking in an opposite direction and taking a step back into the calorie restriction uh, history and asking a question that has been asked for many decades, um, and that's what's actually being altered in a calorie-restricted diet that promotes health and longevity. So when we think about a diet, we think about three major macronutrient categories, protein, fat, and carbohydrate. And for many years, we've been told by uh, the government in the form of the USDA and the Institute on Medicine that we should be reducing the proportion of our calories that come from either fat or carbohydrate. And the reasons for this are basically the idea that fat perhaps promotes cardiovascular disease, while carbohydrates might promote obesity and diabetes. Since nobody really thinks that Americans should be eating less, except for MDs, I suppose, um, and certainly the dietary advice is that we should limit our calories overall, but, but there's not an expectation that many people will do that. This inevitably leads to the assumption that we should be increasing our protein consumption. And in fact, every year up until this very uh, past year, the official dietary advice of the USDA has been that we should increase uh, our protein consumption. Americans overall eat about 17% of their calories from protein, and the quote-unquote safe range ranges up to about 30 to 35 percent, according to Institute on Medicine guidelines. So conceivably, we could really dramatically increase the amount of dietary protein. There's two reasons for this, and one is to minimize fat and carbohydrate consumption. And the other is the basis of several types of fad diets, which is that high protein consumption promotes satiety. And so if we had a lot of our protein, uh, if we're eating a lot of protein, we might actually reduce our calorie intake a little bit. So the question that we wanted to ask was, how much protein should we be eating? As I mentioned, this is a historically very interesting question in the calorie-restricted field that really doesn't ha didn't have a good answer. A lot of the early rodent experiments um, showed that some protein-restricted diets were healthy and some were unhealthy, and there's a lot of variation between the types of uh, experiments that were done. And so for myself, this was brought to the forefront by a study by Steve Simpson and David Lacruda's group uh, there was published a couple of years ago in which they fed black six mice one of 25 different diets, all of which uh, varied in their macronutrient ratios. And the thing that was really uh, the most dramatic effect that they found was simply that mice that ate very low protein diets lived the longest. In their particular study, they used a diet in which 5% of calories came from protein. And so those mice were living the longest. And well, you know, one of the questions that we need to address is what's going on here. So this actually has a lot of support that this type of data is not just relevant to mice, but it's also relevant to humans. So in the same issue of cell metabolism, Walter Longo's laboratory published an epidemiological uh, survey of, a, of some databases showing that low-protein diets in humans are actually associated with decreased incidence of cancer and mortality. Now, I should note that this is true for people under the age of 65. There didn't seem to be an effect on people over the age of 65, and you could imagine that there's a lot of reasons that people who are older might have increased protein needs um, to fight off sarcopenia uh, and age-related muscle loss. Um, but even before this study, there had been a lot of studies about what happens with humans. Since human protein consumption wire varies widely between people on various different types of fat diets, people who are vegans, vegetarians, very interested in high protein diets, there's been a lot of opportunity to gather data on what happens in humans. And so this is from a European study of about 30,000 individuals, and diabetes risk is highest, twice as high in the quartile that consumed the most protein versus the quartile that consumed the lowest amount of protein. So again, this suggests that there is something uh, negative, particularly from a metabolic standpoint, uh, of, of high protein consumption. And about 10 years ago, a study of Swedish women showed that a high protein diet was actually associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. So again, evidence that dietary protein and the advice that we increase our dietary protein consumption uh, may not be applicable to either mice or humans. 
So today I'm going to move beyond the idea that a uh, calorie is a calorie and talk about the particular effects of dietary protein and the makeup of dietary protein, um, what we'll call protein quality. And so we'll talk about some studies that have uh, been published on a protein-restricted diet in humans and trying to understand the metabolic effects of specific dietary amino acids uh, in mice. And then I'm going to talk about some unpublished work uh, looking at altering dietary amino acids as an intervention in diabetes and obesity and intervening in a disease of rapid aging. And uh, finally, I will uh, offer some concluding remarks. So as I mentioned, there have been a lot of surveys in the literature using epidemiological databases and nutritional surveys to try and understand some of the effects of dietary protein on health, longevity, and metabolism. But there had never been a true randomized clinical trial of what happens uh, when you do protein restriction in terms of metabolism. And so to do this, we teamed up with uh, Luigi Fontana's laboratory at the University of Washington, St. Louis, who is conducting a human clinical trial protein restriction for prostate cancer. And so in this study, subjects were randomly enrolled in either a protein-restricted group or a control group. And the protein-restricted group were fed a specific diet containing 7 to 9 percent of their calories coming from protein, while the control group had no dietary modifications and about 17 percent of their calories came from protein, very typical um, for uh, Americans overall. And all of the, the subjects in this survey were about 53-year-old men uh, with low-grade prostate cancer. The total length of the intervention was just over six weeks. And so we got a lot of metabolic data um, from blood as well as DEXA analysis of the individuals here and measuring physical characteristics. But the, so just to highlight the parts that are most interesting, um, so over the course of a six-week study, um, the subjects lost approximately one pound a week uh, for a total of almost six pounds. And about half of that was from fat mass. And so this is very interesting because a lot of what you'll find out about low-protein diets, if you go to Google or really anywhere else in the literature, will be telling you that low-protein diets will cause you to lose fat mass and gain an adiposity. And so obviously some lean mass was lost here as well, but the fact that we lost a significant amount of adipose mass was, was very intriguing. And blood glucose levels were also uh, decreased very significantly, um, suggesting that this might be uh, overall a very be beneficial uh, intervention uh, for health. Now, there's one part here that's really interesting and would, to us, and that's that I mentioned that dietary protein promotes satiety. And so the subjects here actually ate more calories. They ate 10% more calories than their baseline food intake um, when they're placed on protein restriction. So they ate more, but they lost a significant amount of weight. So what we wanted to do was study this in a lot more detail than is possible in humans, um, which inevitably, you know, not only do we have IRB-related constraints, but there's lots of constraints about what type of tissues you could sample from a mouse, what type of uh, human, and what type of measurements you could do. And so we wanted to move into a mouse system. And we did this by establishing a system in which we fed mice one of two different diets, either 21% or 7% uh, protein diet, um, varying in uh, protein content. The diets were matched for calories, so they're isocaloric, and fat was held constant between them. So the calorie deficit is made up with carbohydrates. And we measured the effect of, on weight, body composition, and glucose homeostasis overall. So the first thing that we saw was that just as with humans, we see that mice fed a low-protein diet have a significant increase in food consumption. Um, and this is in accordance with a lot of the literature on low-protein diets. Um, it basically uh, fits very well with the idea that uh, protein has sort of unique leverage and promotes uh, food consumption up to a certain level of total protein intake. And here's some, um, some weight changes during the course of the study. Um, after three weeks and eight weeks on the diet, these are young C57 black 6 male mice. So you can see that they're gaining weight. Uh, they gain about six grams by the end of eight weeks. And weight loss, or weight gain rather, in the protein-restricted mice is about half that. So they gain significantly less weight. Um, but interestingly, uh, in, con in uh, agreement with the idea that this promotes uh, leanness and fat mass loss um, and does not promote fat mass gain, 
the mice did not gain adipose tissue mass. Instead, they gained lean mass. Now, they gained lean, less lean mass than the control diet fed mice, but they're not becoming fattier here. So this seems to be, overall, very metabolically favorable. Now, where is this energy going? And what we found, and sub other groups have subsequently shown as well, is that mice fed a low-protein diet also uh, have an increase in energy expenditure. And we'll talk, about, we'll talk later in my talk about um, what mediates uh, this and uh, so on. But that's where the energy is going. Um, basically, they're burning a bit more of it in the form of heat. Um, other plot markers of metabolic health seem to also be improved. We saw a similar decrease in blood glucose as we do in humans placed on a low-protein diet. Um, interestingly, we also saw a decrease in fasting insulin, which we do not see in humans, um, and overall improved insulin sensitivity. So one of the things I'm going to show several of today is a glucose tolerance test. And the way we conduct our glucose tolerance test is that we fast mice overnight, and then at the zero time point here, we read blood glucose levels and then inject the mice um, with glucose IP. And so then we, over the next two hours, we could track how their glucose levels change with time. And so the basic idea here is that mice that have a really healthy um, metabolism will be able to restore their blood glucose levels to normal relatively quickly, while diabetic or metabolically impaired mice will have a greater area under the curve. We'll see some of those curves later. Um, and we'll have reduced glucose tolerance. And what we see is that mice on the low-protein diet have improved glucose tolerance as assessed by area under the curve. Um, when we think about what goes into glucose tolerance, there are a couple of major uh, contributors. One of them is hepatic gluconeogenesis. And so we can inject pyruvate, um, which is then metabolized by the liver into glucose, and we can measure blood glucose as a reading, readout for hepatic gluconeogenesis. And what we find as a result of this pyruvate tolerance test is indeed that mice have improved pyruvate tolerance uh, relative to control diet mice, um, suggesting that they have either uh, decreased basal gluconeogenesis or improved hepatic insulin sensitivity. In some CLAMP studies that we recently completed with Joe Bauer's lab at the University of Pennsylvania, um, we found that indeed both of these is true, that by restricting the amount of dietary protein, we see improvements in both uh, reduction in both basal uh, hepatic gluconeogenesis and improvement in suppression of gluconeogenesis by insulin. So we started out here by asking what in a calorie-restricted diet contributes to some of these metabolic effects. And we now wanted to take this to the next level and ask what is it about a protein-restricted diet that has these uh, beneficial outcomes. And so, of course, the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. Um, there are, as we learn in graduate school, many amino acids. But traditionally, we think about 20 amino acids uh, in terms of those in the diet, and nine of which are essential. And so we started by analyzing the effect of the three branch chain amino acids, or as I'll refer to them today, BCAAs, um, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And these amino acids are particularly interesting because uh, they're elevated in diabetics. And that's true both for human diabetics, obese and insulin-resistant humans, and also in several different rodent models, including the Zucker fatty rat, diet-induced obese rats, and OBOB mice. So overall, overall, plasma branched amino acids are correlated very well um, with glucose control, or rather poor glucose control. You can see that plasma leucine level um, in both subjects with and without type 2 diabetes actually correlate very well um, with glycated hemoglobin, which is a commonly used marker for uh, uh, diabetes nowadays. There's another reason that we looked at these amino acids in particular, and that's because we did amino acid profiling on the humans who were on a protein-restricted diet. And what we observed was that there was a significant decrease in the blood levels uh, of the three branch chain amino acids, between 10 and 20 percent um, for each one. And interestingly, this was almost entirely specific to the branched chain amino acids. And in particular, many people here are probably familiar with the effects of methionine restriction, which also extend, which extends lifespan and promotes um, good glucose metabolism. Methionine levels were unchanged in protein-restricted humans, which was actually quite surprising to us. The other reason we wanted to focus on the branched chain amino acids is that a lot of people take extra branched chain amino acid supplements for uh, weight gain and, and um, muscle building. 
And interestingly, if you look on the internet, you can even find people who advise you to take branched chain amino acid supplements for treatment of diabetes. And there is a little bit of rationale to this. If you had more muscle mass, probably you would have better control of your blood glucose levels. Um, but on the other hand, most people who are really weight builders probably don't have type 2 diabetes anyway. And so we wanted to ask a question that hadn't really been addressed uh, before. Because there's been a lot of studies on what happens when you supplement either humans or rodents with uh, branched chain amino acids as well as several studies looking at what happens when you remove individual amino acids from the diet. This is a very classic type of experiment originally used to define what the essential amino acids were. But we wanted to ask what's the question of a physiological reduction of branched amino acids on metabolic health. And this type of intervention, unlike removing an amino acid from the diet entirely, would be longer term and more sustainable. So to start up, out this set with these set of experiments, we first needed to determine whether or not um, we could actually do this. And so we constructed a series of amino acid-defined diets varying in their um, amino acid content, such that 21, 7, or 5% of calories were derived from amino acids. And the 5% level here was chosen to match um, the protein concentration in Steve Simpson and David Lucruder's paper, whereas the low amino acid and control diets the total of the levels there were uh, reflective of the amino acid composition of our natural source diets. And so we see very similar phenotypes when we place these mice on amino acid-defined diets. We see that these mice eat significantly more, um, just as mice placed on natural source, control, or protein-restricted diets. Um, and that weight gain was significantly ablated. Um, one of the things that I will highlight here is that we saw a significant degree of weight loss in mice placed on a low amino acid 5% diet. And so we essentially decided not to use that diet um, due to the fact that it doesn't seem to be that sustainable over the long term. Moreover, 7% and 5% levels of, of amino acids had similar effects on glucose tolerance. Both of these diets uh, significantly improved area under the curve during glucose tolerance test. And they also had similar effects on pyruvate tolerance, suggesting that they are equally efficacious at improving hepatic insulin sensitivity and suppressing hepatic gluconeogenesis. And so we selected the 7% diet because it seemed to be metabolically equivalent to the 5% diet um, without causing significant degrees of weight loss. So we then proceeded to the study that we really wanted to do, um, analyzing the effect of the branched chain amino acids. And so we constructed a series of four diets, a control diet in which 21% of calories from amino acid came from amino acids, a low amino acid diet matching the amino acid composition of our natural source protein-restricted diet, in which 7% of calories came from amino acids, a low branched-chain amino acid in which leucine, isoleucine, valine levels were all reduced by two-thirds from the level of the control diet to the level of the low amino acid diet, and a low leucine diet in which we specifically reduced leucine by two-thirds. There being a lot of literature on leucine in particular uh, in the control of metabolism. I should note that all of these diets are isocaloric. They all contain the same level of fat. And uh, while the data I'm about to show you uh, makes up the calorie deficits in these diets with carbohydrates, we've repeated these experiments by making the diet, making up the calorie deficit with non-essential amino acids increased proportionally, and the results are identical. So mice fed a low branched chain amino acid diet eat more, uh, but they weigh less. And interestingly, you can see that they almost eat as much, uh, essentially eat just as much as mice uh, fed a low amino acid diet. And this is something that had never been observed before. And in fact, in rats, it's not clear that this is true. Um, but at least in mice, it appears that a branched chain amino acid deficit is directly sensed by the mice. And so they eat more to compensate for that. Um, looking at weight change, uh, again, these are young C57 black 6 male mice. And so over the course of 10 weeks, the mice here gain a little over 6 grams. Mice fed a low leucine diet, gain essentially the same amount of weight, perhaps a little bit more. And you can see that the weight gain is very significantly blunted or blocked by feeding of a low amino acid or a low branch chain amino acid diet. Yes? So these are mice started at nine weeks of age. So they're certainly past the major growth spurt. Technically, they're adult. But of course, we know that mice keep growing until at least six uh, months of age or so. Yeah. 
Um, so we've also uh, placed mice at uh, 16 months of age on these diets. Um, in those diets, what we see is a little bit of weight loss, probably about 3% or so. Um, whereas the control diet mice, when switched to the amino acid defined diet, probably gain about 3% or so. Um, so there's a weight separation, but they don't really gain, lose weight significantly. Yes? I'm curious, um, how did you measure how much food was consumed? Um, so, mm, I'm trying to remember. I believe that this particular experiment um, is one in which we were housing the mice two per cage, and so we uh, measured the food in versus the food that was left um, over the course of a three of over the course of three days. Um, but in subsequent experiments, we also placed the mice in metabolic chambers that have teared um, feeding um, things, so we can measure milligram by milligram as they consume, and the results are similar. Yes. So in this particular, so always in the low amino acid diet, we're compensating with high carbohydrates. Um, in the case of a low branched chain amino acid diet presented here in the low leucine diet, we're making up the calorie deficit with carbohydrates. Although you have to realize that the actual amount of calories that's caused by reducing the branched chain amino acids um, by two thirds is really not that much. Um, but we also have repeated these experiments and have now switched over to a paradigm in which um, we make up the deficit by proportionally increasing all of the non-essential amino acids. And we get the same results either way. Um, so we next looked at body composition as well. The results here are slightly different in terms of what's going on. We see that there's an effect on both fat mass and lean mass. Um, and you can see, in particular, um, all of the mice are still gaining fat mass on the low amino acid and low branched chain amino acid diets, whereas we're largely but not completely blocking uh, lean mass gain. Um, but overall, uh, the, the mice are not really changing in their weights uh, that much. So one thing that's actually quite interesting, and this was an unexpected finding from, from our uh, end, was that we noticed that although, since we're doing multiple group comparisons, there is not a statistically significant difference between control mice and low leucine diet fed mice. Um, it was very clear to us that the low leucine diet mice seemed fattier. And literally, when we sort of picked up the mice, we could tell that their skin was sliding around. And something was weird. And so we decided to analyze that um, when we dissected the mice at the end of the experiment to collect tissues. And what we observed was quite interesting. As you can sort of see, there's a trend here. It's not statistically significant for low amino acid and low branch chain amino acid diet mice um, to have a slightly thinner intradermal fat layer. Um, but what is statistically significant is that there's a significant increase in intradermal fat um, in both the belly and back surfaces of the mice fed a low leucine diet. And uh, it's not just uh, this intradermal fat pad either. Uh, here you can see we basically get a doubling in the thickness. Um, we also got a doubling of the thickness in the epididymal uh, white adipose tissue as well. Typically, that's thought of as a type of visceral fat, although it's not directly comparable to humans. Subcutaneous fat uh, in terms of inguinal fat also seemed to be increased, although it was not statistically significant to the high degree of variability. And so this suggests and then, while we don't have a perfect explanation for this, and we're still trying to understand the molecular mechanism behind this, um, my personal theory is that this explains why there's a lot of people who think that a protein-restricted diet um, might cause adiposity. And since protein quality wa varies very widely, someone who was consuming a low-protein diet that was particularly deficient in leucine, assuming that these results apply to human, might be in a re leucine-restricted state. And so we might see these types of increases in belly skin, or visceral fat. Yes? Um, we have not looked at any high leucine diets. Um, so moving on to some of our additional metabolic characterization, we performed glucose tolerance tests on these mice after about three weeks. And what we found was that there is a significant improvement in glucose tolerance on all uh, of the restricted diets. So low leucine diet, a low branched chain amino acid diet, as well as the total of restriction of amino acids all of these improve glucose tolerance. Now, interestingly, this happens at three weeks. And so we saw at the, when we dissected the mice that the low leucine diet mice had all this fat mass gain. And this presumably accumulates over time. 
And so when we repeated these experiments after uh, nine weeks on the diet, what we see is that the effect of a low leucine diet on glucose tolerance actually disappears. And so a low leucine diet in terms of long-term effects does not promote glucose tolerance. The low leucine and low branch chain amino acid diets, as far as we can determine, um, promote glucose tolerance for at least four months and, and possibly beyond that as well. Um, we, just haven't, we just don't have all of that data. And we saw a specific improvement in pyruvate tolerance in just the mice fed a low branch chain amino acid or low total amino acid diet mice. One of the things that's actually quite interesting, and we'll get to a possible mechanism for this in a little bit, is that we see mice on a low branch chain amino acid diet, although they have improved pyruvate tolerance, um, they don't have as much pyruvate tolerance, not as pyruvate tolerance as mice uh, in which all of the amino acids have been restricted. And so this suggests to us that other amino acids might be involved in this type of response. Now I should tell you, yes? Um, we do have a profile of amino acid levels of these mice, and it's very complicated. Uh, so um, I will tell you that unlike uh, humans, mice placed on these diets actually defend their plasma branch chain amino acids, actually all of their plasma amino acid levels quite well. Um, however, tissue concentrations of amino acids do change. And so that is something, uh, so I think looking at amino acid levels in the tissues may be more relevant than the plasma levels. The plasma levels, even of the low protein restricted mice, don't change. Um, but we do see about a 50% reduction in branch chain amino acid levels when we look, for instance, specifically in the liver of the low, low amino acid diet fed mice. Um, whether that's true in humans is sort of an interesting question that we don't have the answer to as well because we don't have liver biopsies. But you have to imagine that plasma levels are, change, are changing in the humans. Perhaps a compensatory reaction is that maybe they're not changing as much in the liver of humans. Um, one of the other major contributors to glucose tolerance is islets and islet functions. And there's a decent amount of literature about leucine and leucine catabolites, such as KIC, promoting insulin secretion. And so we analyzed um, insulin levels both in vivo, and we didn't really see too much of a change in uh, glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. And we also looked here at um, ex vivo islets. And so what we see here, so this is, this is what most islet biologists will look, like, will look at at the end. They look at the percent of insulin that the islet contains um, and, and how it, that's secreted in response to uh, high glucose levels. So we see high and low, low and high glucose levels here. And you see overall in terms of insulin secretion, there's not much of a change. What's actually happening is that each individual islet is secreting much less insulin um, when isolated from mice placed on a low branch chain amino acid or low amino acid diet. Um, but their insulin levels in the each per islet are also decreased. And so overall, the islets are functioning normally but they need to secrete less insulin, presumably due to the fact that glucose levels are also lower. We've also conducted some metabol uh, metabolic analysis that's actually in our published manuscript here, but I'm not going to present, uh, showing uh, more FRET-based and fluorescent sensors looking at islet biology. So what's the mechanism behind all of these effects? So one of the most potent things that's known about protein restriction overall is that protein restriction induces a hormone called FGF21. And so that's an insulin sensitizing hormone that's normally produced in response to fasting. And it's uh, produced um, in response not only to fasting, but also by a low protein diet. And this is true in both humans and mice. Um, interestingly, humans take a lot longer to produce FGF21 in response to fasting than mice do. Uh, it was recently shown that uh, if you fast humans for about a week, they produce FGF21, whereas mice uh, will produce FGF21 after about 12 hours. Um, and FGF21 is a major mediator of some of the effects of protein restriction. Um, in fact, it was shown that FGF21 promotes energy expenditure as well as hepatic insulin sensitivity in some work by Christopher Morrison's labs and others. But that's not actually what's going on here. So what we see is that a mice fed a low amino acid diet indeed have a robust uh, stimulation of FGF21. We see about a th two to three-fold increase uh, versus mice on a control diet. But mice fed a low branch chain amino acid diet do not have this induction. And FGF21 is actually produced by many tissues, um, most notably the, the liver, but also muscle, adipose tissue, um, and uh, actually others as well. Um, and we see that in these tissues, particularly liver and muscle, we see an induction of mRNA of FGF21 in mice fed a low amino acid diet, 
but not when we restrict branch chain amino acids. Downstream of FGF21, uh, I mentioned energy expenditure, and indeed we see increased energy expenditure, again, uh, particularly at night, in mice fed a low amino acid diet, um, explaining their leanness and potentially their metabolic health as, as well. Um, and FGF21 also stimulates the production of adiponectin, um, and that was worked out about five or six years ago uh, by another group. Um, and you can see that we get increased adiponectin following uh, this low amino acid diet, but not in response to low branch chain amino acids. And so this suggests the low branch chain amino acids in terms of their effect um, may be less in terms of their effect on the liver due to the fact that adiponectin and FGF21 are being produced by the low amino acid diet mice. Um, trying to understand what the actual metabolic effects and effectors of a low branch chain amino acid diet, something that we're obviously quite interested in. So to summarize this portion of the talk, what we've shown here is that if we look at either humans on a protein-restricted diet, mice on a protein-restricted diet, mice on amino acid-restricted diet, or mice on a branch chain amino acid-restricted diet, um, all have very similar metabolic outcomes, um, promoting leanness and promoting blood sugar control. So overall, um, one other take-home lesson is that we may want to rethink the idea of taking branched amino acid supplements, at least in the context of people who aren't involved in weight building, um, and instead focus perhaps on some of the natural food options such as uh, fruits and nuts that are naturally low in protein, um, or perhaps some non-traditional options uh, such as Nutella ice cream, or as I discovered uh, from the grand rounds in my own department, um, uh, cream-filled donuts, very low in protein, uh, about 5% according to the Dunkin' Donuts website. Um, and uh, if you were to take this to its logical extreme, you might concentrate on things like breakfast cereal, although you might occasionally want to supplement that with some milk. I'd like to thank uh, everyone in my laboratory, uh, particularly Nicole Cummings, the graduate student who spearheaded most of the work that I've shown you today, and the host of undergraduate students that have uh, helped us out on this project, particularly with the progeroid uh, monitoring. Um, our funding sources, uh, particularly uh, the Progeria Research Foundation for the Progeria work, uh, the Wisconsin Partnership Program, and the NIH for some of our work on branched chain amino acids, and uh, all of our uh, collaborators uh, who helped to make this possible. And also, of course, the organizers here for, for inviting me and helping allowing me to present this work to you. Thank you. Um, we have not looked at nuclear morphology yet. We would love to collaborate and work with someone and look at nuclear morphology. Yes? So you know that the African diet has been popular for a while, right? That's a high-protein diet. That's right. So which is the opposite of what you're doing in your low-protein diet. What do we know about the insulin glucose dehydrogen in the food? Um, to the best of my knowledge, the Atkins diet, which is high in protein, there's a couple, there's a couple caveats with the, with the Atkins diet. The first is my understanding is that no human is actually capable of sustaining the true Atkins diet long term um, because humans are not able to physically or mentally uh, to consume as much protein uh, as is called for the, for the diet sustainably. That if you track people who are on the Atkins diet, after the initial protein spike, the protein level declines over some time, and that's why they regain weight. Um, and so I think that that's one problem with the pro Atkins diet. The other uh, point is that, um, in particular, in the uh, Swedish study uh, where they showed increased cardiovascular mortality, they're actually looking at some people who had been following the Atkins diet and observed increased cardiovascular mortality. So um, while I think some of the metabolic phenotypes may be mediated by certain mechanisms that we don't necessarily understand, and I think some of them may be mediated um, by the dietary restriction that's induced by high levels of protein. Uh, but I don't think it overall that it's probably good. Yes? Yes, how do you or do you plan to couple these experiments with uh, exercise regimes? Um, we have not uh, thought about uh, coupling them to an, with an exercise regime very much. Uh, that would be something that uh, would be kind of interesting to do. You would predict that uh, in the absence of branched amino acids, they're going to put on less muscle. And I think that that's probably uh, 
Uh, def I think that that's probably definitely true. One thing we don't know and I think would be interesting to look at is in the context of, you know, an aging animal um, that's a little bit, that's, you know, close to having sarcopenia, what the effects of these diets would be, and then whether exercise would be protective against that. Yes? So in speaking of aging, so do these red chain amino acids accumulate to age? I'm going to limit myself by saying that to, from my own work and what it work that is published, it is not known. Um, or rather, the published metabolomics data on the metabolomics of aging um, that was published in Cell Metabolism maybe one or two years ago by a group at the Broad um, found that the major amino acid changes with aging were methionine in the brain and tryptophan in the liver, if I remember correctly, and that BCAs were not implicated. Uh, I have heard rumors that that may not be true, but I don't know that for myself. Yes? Uh, from your data, it seems that leucine cannot be uh, the primary source of your uh, penile testing of your but we also plan on looking at like isoleucine or valine to see if it's leucine. Yes, so those studies are ongoing. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's interesting is, well, there, there's a couple of different possibilities, right? So one possibility is that isoleucine or valine are the key mediators of these phenotypes. Um, and I don't think that I believe that. Um, my personal theory is that most likely it's likely to be a combination. Um, as you can imagine, there's actually several different combinations that you could test there, and whether or not it's just one or, or all three or t a specific two is something that will be pretty interesting to try and figure out. Um, and so all those uh, projects are underway, and hopefully someone will fund the grant that we wrote to look at that. Yes? Um, so, you know, our human study with our low, brand, uh, low uh, protein diet suggests the low protein diet, those, those diets were also high in carbohydrates because you have to balance the calories somehow. Um, and so the humans and the mice were both eating low protein, high carbohydrate diets. They both lost weight. They both had lower blood glucose levels. Um, only the mice, in terms of a natural source diets, had lower insulin. Um, there was an increase in F21 in both, in both species. Um, I'm sure there's other metabolic differences and similarities, um, but we don't have any data to suggest at this time that humans would not respond in the same way. Yes? Hello. Uh, the branch chain amino acid is it essential amino acid? Uh, yes, these are all essential amino acids. So. Well, this is a very interesting question. So uh, what type of food can actually contain uh, low branch chain amino acids? So um, it's, a, it's, a, so it's a very interesting question. So how do you answer that type of question? So I approached a number of, of human clinical nutritionists who deal with patients with maple syrup urine disease. And so I thought that they would be able to provide advice to me on what type of food that their patients eat. And it turns out um, that these patients who need to eat low um, branch amino acid diet containing food um, supplemented with medical powder that basically contains no branch amino acids um, are all, there, there's almost no real clear scientific approach um, to dosing them. Um, it is all done empirically. And they come in every month and they get their branched amino acid levels and they get told to eat more or less protein. And one of the reasons for that is that people have a very high level of, of physical activity and people who have more muscle mass and are more physically active need more branched chain amino acids to maintain that muscle mass. Um, and so they're all dosed with different individual amounts of uh, branched chain amino acid free food or low protein food and so on. So I turn to the rodent nutritionists and the rodent nutritionists were able to point me to the USDA's food database. And so you can all go and look on this database, and it contains um, full nutritional information for something like 10,000 different foods. Um, you can look specifically at branched chain amino acids. It's a little clunky to search because um, you can download leucine, isoleucine and valine information for about 5,000, maybe 6,000 foods. Um, it's clunky because you can only look at three things at a time, 
and there's a lot of foods that contain zero protein and thus have very little leucine. So you also need to look at caloric content and so on. The take home is that um, foods vary widely, um, both um, between different types of food and between what animal or plant or whatever it comes from. Overall, in foods, there's about an order of magnitude difference between the foods that are protein containing and have low branched chain amino acids to high branched chain amino acids. Unfortunately, there's no clear rule. I would say that the, the rules that I have seen are basically that beef tends to be high, pork tends to be low, and um, in particular, there's a lot of concern in uh, the state of Wisconsin about cheese, and cheese also varies widely in a branched chain amino acid levels. Um, as I recall, Gouda is low and Swiss is high. Um, but fortunately, there's 600 types of cheese made in the state of Wisconsin, so probably you can pick, pick between them to find your low uh, amino acid foods and your high amino acid foods. I think really, if we want to do really good um, nutritional advice, probably pe people will have to start going out to you know, do a little bit more rigorous research because this database exists, but I don't know that anyone really cares how much variation there might be from batch to batch of, say, a cheese product or a variation between individual animals. So there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of overall uh, open questions. Do the branched-chain amino acids contribute to the taste? Do branched-chain amino acids contribute to the taste? Uh, it's a hard question to answer. Um, so amino acid defined food is believed overall to and is um, bitter, um, and that's because con constitutive amino acids are bitter. Um, you know, one of the things that would be nice to do in the future is uh, switch over to a system that includes more natural source protein, and so. Dealing with uh, our supplier variation, I was mentioning to some people before that at one point in the past we actually had a, in a previous study we had some problems because the source dietary protein switched. And of course when you're ordering food in an animal facility, they're always changing batch to batch, season to season, what the exact components of the food are, basically you know, buying whatever's cheapest. Um, so what we'd like to do though is switch over to some to find protein sources supplemented with different amino acids um, so that we can have some more natural texture and roughage and so on in the animal so that we can do some more involved studies. Um, but I don't know, and maybe, maybe I don't know if there's a taste biologist here, but um, you know, maybe, I'm sure there are taste receptors that engage branched amino acids, but I don't know how they contribute to the taste. And also, if you're eating food, right, presumably the individual branch chain amino acids are probably masked by the protein structure in some way and the fact that they're intact. So I don't know, and I think it would be a difficult question to answer. Adam? So we've, the, what, um, we've done a couple of different things, looking at the microbiome and looking at uh, gene expression, and we're starting to uh, dive down a little bit more. You know, my personal um, guess is that the methionine uh, restriction in the low amino acid diet is what contributes to the FGF21 induction. Uh, people have shown that methionine restriction in, on, on its own is sufficient to induce FGF21. Um, although the biology by which FGF21 uh, is induced seems very... Uh, unclear to me. I don't know if anyone else has a, has a better handle on it, but it seems to be, you know, mTOR dependent in different directions and different tissues, and sometimes p -par alpha is involved, and I'm not really sure exactly what's going on. But overall, in terms of microbiota effects, we see very similar effects on the microbiome. We see very, um, uh, we see overlapping but very different uh, gene expression patterns uh, in the liver. And so that's some evidence that they might be working through different mechanisms. Um, but uh, we're still trying to understand uh, what the biology is, is, and we have a variety of mouse models on the way to sort of address that. 